You can be seated. What a joy it is to gather with you around communion table today. Thank you, Pastor Jeremy, Pastor Pat. What a great worship team. Today we're in Colossians chapter 3, verses 15 to 17. If, if you would, just remain seated. I'm going to read our passage, and then we'll be in the Word together today. I want to welcome you who are visitors, those who are watching online. I've been sending a few messages to folks online today, too, so welcome to all of you. Let me read Colossians chapter 3, verses 15 to 17. And, you know, I really do believe this, that this is the Word of God. And just by reading this, God can work in this room. So, like, this might be the best part of the sermon. You ready? Here it is. This is the word of God. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God and whatever you do. In word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So, Father, that is why we've gathered here today, that we would exalt the name of Jesus. I thank you that he is the great peacemaker. And, Lord, I pray that today peace would reign and rule in our hearts and also in our relationships. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, uh, during communion, Jeremy had pointed out that it's God who really initiated right relationship with us. Like, he pursued us. We actually sang it in the songs today, too. Like, God was the one chasing us down. If you know God today, it's not because you went looking for him. He came looking for you. Like, he wanted you. He wanted a relationship with you. And as we're in this book of Colossians, the, the, the Apostle Paul is trying to remind them of the preeminence of Christ. In fact, turn back to Colossians chapter 1 just for a moment. Look at verse 18. It says this about Jesus. And he is the head of the body, the church. We are his body. Jeremy was correct when he said that we have this unity. Communion reflects that because we're all partakers of Christ. So we're this body. But Jesus is is the head. He's the most important part of the body. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. And so, so he has always existed. He's God, very God. And he's also the first one that has this resurrected body. He did indeed rise from the dead. And we will have bodies just like his one day. That in everything he might be preeminent. Have that first place, right? But then notice the next verse, verse 19. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things. Whether on earth or in heaven. Making peace by the blood of his cross. And so Jesus came to make peace with us. He came to satisfy God's holy anger against us so that we could be right with God. So therefore, we can say with confidence, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so because we have peace with him, what he calls us to do is to be at peace with each other. To actually be people who pursue peace. He pursued it with us. We're to pursue it with others. That's really the whole point of the last three weeks of sermons from the book of Colossians is that we are to be governed by this or driven by this idea of like, I want to be somebody that does everything I can do to be at peace with other people. And today we come to part three of that series. And today we come to the rule of peace, the rule of peace, that peace would rule in our hearts and that it's the peace of Christ that would rule our relationships, that that's what would be the final arbiter or judge or the umpire in that as we're going to see today. So, so the first week we talked about just the danger of anger, that we're to avoid anger, unrighteous anger, that manifests itself in things like malice and slander and obscene talk. You're never going to have great relationships with other, other people if you're an angry person. So we're to put that to death. Did you catch that in verse 8? But now you must put them away, literally kill anger, wrath, malice, slander. And that starts with me. That's one of the first counseling principles for me when I'm talking with people is just the one person principle. The first thing you have to understand is you're responsible for you before God. And the place that I can start is what is the condition of my heart? Are there things that I'm angry about? Is there past hurts that I need to forgive? Are there expectations? Maybe sometimes that aren't so realistic that I have of other people. So I'm constantly disappointed being angry at other people. I don't know. Maybe ask around. Do other people see you as an angry person? The interesting thing, though, we tend to think of an angry person as somebody that has outbursts all the time. But that's not always the case. There are some people that kind of stuff their anger, and then right at the right moment it might come out. 
There's also people that kind of leak out their anger, right? It just comes in sarcastic comments, put downs, whatever. So it's not maybe this great display of anger. But the reality of it is, is if God is no longer angry at me because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for my sins, then, then I really don't have justification to be angry at others. I can honestly say God has been been good. And so we, we don't have to walk in that anger. And, and by the way, we're freed from that anger in Christ. It's like a good thing. It's a gift God's given us. But then the second thing we saw was this idea that we're to, to put, on, put on love, to put on this grace. It, it literally means dress for relational success. Look at verse 12. It says, put on then as God's chosen and holy beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must forgive. And then verse 14, and above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And, and, and so you could, say it, you could say it this way. In fact, Billy Graham said this, hot heads and cold hearts never solved anything. That is so true. Hot heads and cold hearts never solved anything. And really what he's saying here is don't be a hot head and have a warm heart. So have, a, you know, so, so have a cool head and a warm heart. Those are the first two ingredients of healthy relationships with one another. But then today we come to this third thing. And the, and, and the, and the third thing that we see the Apostle Paul gives is that we're to have this rule of peace. That the peace of Christ is to rule or govern our hearts. There's another counseling principle that I always would teach in, in, in meetings with people that are having relational difficulties. And that's the rebound principle. The rebound principle, which says this. The harder you throw a ball against a wall, the harder it comes back. Now, that's just basic physics, right? Like, the harder you toss that ball against the wall. When I was a kid growing up, we had this game we played in the neighborhood against garage doors. Our, we had wood garage doors then, not metal ones. You could throw balls against them and not dent them. Not that that ever stopped my neighborhood kids from throwing balls against my garage door, but whatever, they're worth it. So... So we would play this game called Buns Up. And I, I don't know how appropriate probably that game is. I know you played it too. That's good. So like so any, any men in my age group played Buns Up. What is Buns Up? Well, what you do is you, you have other guys here. You throw a ball against the wall. When it was your turn, you had to try to catch that ball and throw it back. If you missed it, you had to go up in front of the garage door, bend over, put your buns up, and then everybody else got to throw at you as hard as they want to. <laughs> what a gracious game. Isn't that awesome? Man, you look like you still want to play that. You're on your own. My foot's broken. <laughs> we did other cruel things to each other too. Teenage boys, you know? But the idea was, is the harder you throw that ball against the wall, the less likely you were to have to have your funds up because your opponent wasn't going to catch it and be able to return it against the wall. But I think a lot of us come in hot when it comes to relationships, especially if there's an offense or a misunderstanding. We're coming in hot. In other words, we're not ruled by, by peace. That's a cruel game, buns up. But it's even a crueler way to live. When we're just throwing the ball hard against the wall, and we think that that's actually going to calm a situation. What if in our relationships we really were governed by this idea, a rule of peace, that we're actually ruled by peace and not by anger and not by, not, not by unforgiveness and not by bitterness? No, Christ's peace will rule this situation. That's what we bring into the situation. I was uh, looking for ways to exercise. I, I love to run. I love to walk. A lot of you, uh, we've walked the block a million times, and I haven't been able to do that in a couple months with my foot. Eventually it will heal. I'm optimistic. But, but so I was just looking for different ways. So I actually Googled, you know, how to exercise with a broken foot. And there's a lady who has an exercise thing for that and tried doing that. And, and, and so then I've gotten these, I, I ordered these, uh, you know, resistance bands, these rubber, big rubber bands basically. And, and I thought, oh, this is a great idea. I can do this right from my seat. And we have this uh, ottoman that has a closing top on it, you know, whatever. And so I'm there, and, I, and then what you do is you stick this ball inside of, like, something behind a door or whatever. So I stuck it inside the ottoman, it closed on it, and I am working out. I mean, I'm, like, going at it, stretching it, going. And just then, the lid to the ottoman opened up. You know what's coming, right? This little ball here came flying at my face and nailed me right in the teeth. At that, I'm like... Ichabod, the glory has departed. You know what I mean? Like, nothing's going right here. My foot is broken and my mouth is bleeding. My sweet wife just heard me because I said, ah, oh. she comes out, she goes, what happened? I said, I'm a knucklehead. 
I just whack myself in the face. She goes, oh, no. I go, yeah. You guys, that's how a lot of us come at each other. It's true, honestly. We're not being ruled by peace. I'm not saying there's not conflict. But what I'm saying is, when there's conflict, not a good idea to pour lighter fluid on that fire. Come in with water. Listen to what God's word says in Proverbs 15.1. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Proverbs 15.8. A hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger calms a dispute. Uh, Matthew Breeden says this. We live in a world that is fractured by conflict and opposition. Isn't that true? We really do live in an angry world. Our culture feeds on strife, argument, hatred, bitterness. Even our news agencies, which were once neutral, now all have an angle. And and I hate to say this to you, but they're trying to actually make you mad. Did you know that? That that trusted news organization that you love so much that you news from, they actually are trying to make you mad because if they can make you mad, they can get you to come back for more. Just watch the headlights. I promise you that's what they're trying to do. Be careful of that. Peace seems elusive in almost every aspect of our society. And unfortunately, the church and our homes often experience the same kind of unrest. And here's what I would tell you. Jesus is worthy of better from us. He's worthy of better from us. We are to be a people that are not in a state of unrest because we are at peace with God through faith in him. We are the people of of peace. I would say to you this way, the heart at rest stands the best chance of having healthy relationships in a world of unrest. If your heart is at rest, and today I'm going to show you exactly why if you're a follower of Jesus, you can say, no, my heart is at rest. I need to walk in that rest. Then you have a much better chance of walking in relationships that are also at rest. Well, let's, let's look at this rule of peace today. Let's look at verse 15. Check out verse 15. It says this. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. So the first thing we see is we're to let this peace of Christ rule. Well, first the idea of rule is is literally an athletic term in the Greek, and it's the idea of a referee or an umpire. And so the idea is the umpire makes the call. So it's not my anger that makes my call, it's not not revenge that makes the call, but in relationships... It's, it's the peace of Christ that makes the final call. When I was a, an umpire, and I absolutely, worst job I ever had being an umpire, I will never do it again. Some of you are referees, umpires. It's absolutely miserable. I don't know how you do it. Like, like I remember I was umpiring, umpiring pony baseball, which is like 13-year-old boys. And those coaches, coaches of 13-year-old boys, I, I'm sorry if, if you're one of them, but there's definitely a possibility of demon possession. <laughs> I, I, honestly, it's, I mean, these people, some of them I would know. Like, I'm like, wow. And at the same time, I was a junior high principal that I was umpiring baseball games for junior hires. And most of them weren't my students. A couple were, but, but I was actually heartbroken because I'm at school during the day trying to pour into them, trying to teach them, you know, like, first of all, the love of God for them, how they should act as a result and whatever. And then I'm going out there and these coaches, and I know some, there's so some many, many great coaches, but, okay, there's one somewhere, I'm sure. But. <laughs> It's just statistically probable. But these coaches would just come unglued. And I remember one time I made this call, you know, like, like the ball, it was, it was going down the first base line as a right-handed batter, and I didn't catch it in time before it had passed the base path to know if it was foul or fair. So I just, it landed foul, so I called it foul. And I mean, well, the coach went foul. He came out screaming at me, yelling at me, and Man, I was just like 23 years old, and he's like, we're paying you good money. <laughs> I remember I, that's the only time I ever talked back to a coach. I'm like, you're not paying me good money. <laughs> now, that part is not true. <laughs> so what was I to do? Because the coach is like, back the other way, like, fair ball. Like, is that going to happen? No. An umpire's decision has to be final. It's decisive. And that's what he's saying here. Let the, let the peace of Christ rule. How many arguments and disputes and ugly situations have we all found ourselves in over the years that if the peace of Christ had ruled instead of my anger, instead of my resentment, how much different could that have gone? So you see what he's saying right here is going, so let the peace of Christ rule. Well, what is the peace of Christ? The Bible has a lot to say about the peace of Christ, and there's three ways you might think of the peace of Christ. Number one, the upward peace of Christ, vertical peace. Romans 5.1 says this, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, 
We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're at peace with God. He's no longer, we're no longer enemies of God because Jesus has satisfied his wrath. You could also think of the inward peace that comes. That's the peace of God. So we have peace with God upward. We have the inward peace. That's the peace of God. Jesus said, my peace I leave to you. Think of Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. You know it. Do not be anxious about anything, but by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I love this. It's the idea of putting a fortress around your mind and your heart. You're in the middle of a storm, and yet you still can maintain peace because you have the peace of God. So I have that peace with God, I have the peace of God, and then there's this outward peace, and that's a peace, a communal peace, a, a, a peace, a relational peace, a horizontal peace peace. Listen to Ephesians 4, 3 to 6. Make every effort, every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. That's what should drive us, is this oneness that we have in Christ. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called, to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. And so the idea here is, is that no, the, it's, it's, it's not about me. It's actually, how much would that help human relationships too if we realize, no, it's all about him. It's Christ is in all and in all, as we saw earlier in Colossians. Like, like, like it's, it, that, that creates that peace. And so I pursue that bond of peace because we are one body, right? Like, like you have two hands, right? If you have two hands and you, you hold your hands out, like they both belong to your body. They're to work together and not against each other. What if one of your hands started to slap the other hand? Like, I don't like you. Or what if your hand decided it doesn't like your face any longer and it starts to slap your face? That's kind of the picture, though. It's going, no, you have this oneness. He doesn't just say fight for the oneness. He says fight for the oneness you already have. You already have it. We have it. We are one. We have a unity in Christ that's been given to us because, as Jeremy said, we've all assimilated Jesus from 1 Corinthians 10 into our lives. You have, I have. We have the same spirit dwelling in us. <laughs> I often think, man, I know God's going to do this. I just know it. When believers on earth go at each other, they're still going to go to heaven, but I'm convinced God is going to make them next door neighbors for all of eternity. <laughs> you couldn't enjoy each other on earth, so now you get to enjoy each other forever in heaven. So be careful who you're fighting with. Who do you want your neighbor to be? So at our house, for whatever reason, I think the bugs are just out right now. We're, I've, I've been getting little spider bites this week. I got like one on my arm, one on my leg, underneath my beautiful boot here that I'm wearing. Like, how did I get in there? You know, whatever. And then yesterday I woke up with one on my neck. And I'm like, oh, that's going to be beautiful. But then I had this thought, like, whatever you do, don't scratch that. Because if you do, every time you scratch it, they just balloon. And I don't want to come in here and have all of you guys say, hey, your foot's broken. I also think you have a tumor on your neck. <laughs> so, so I just kind of like, okay, don't scratch it, don't scratch it. We, here's what we often do. Instead of being peacemakers who are ruled by the peace of Christ that we have, the upward, inward, outward peace of Christ, a lot of times what we're doing is we're actually scratching at those wounds, at those bites, and we're making them worse. And a lot of times it's because we're so convinced we're right, and we want to make sure the other person knows it. Instead of saying, no, I'm content just to be right with God. And I'm, I'm at peace with that. And so what we're hearing here is, is that Christ is to, to be the one, his peace that he's given us, that is to be the umpire in our relationships. It's that peace. And notice what he goes on to say. He says this, to which indeed you were called. Literally, that's a spatial reference. That's, that's you're called into the room of peace in one body, one family, and be thankful. Uh, Roddy Archibald says this, peacemakers carry about with them an atmosphere in which quarrels die a natural death. Did you catch that? So in other words, let's just be honest right now. Like there's just some people that we know that just tend to be peaceful. Peace of Christ just rules them. So you're in a hard situation. Like it tend to the blood pressures are like Christ's peace is ruling, not their emotions, not their like. Yeah, I just so trust the God who sent His Son to die for me that He'll even work out a hard situation. So there's a. It doesn't mean that problems go away. It doesn't mean overlooking or minimizing sin. It does not. Undealt with sin will deal a death blow to peace. 
So it doesn't mean you don't deal with hard things. It just means you do it in a way that you're confident and at rest. God's got this. He's got me. We're going to pursue this, but we're going to do this in a, an attitude of, of peace. If you were, okay, I want you right now to think about this. When you think of a dog that is just approachable, peaceful, a dog that's at peace, what, what kind of dog would you, what, what kind of breed would that be? A lab. I, I think of a lab. I really do. Like lab. We had a lab for a while, and what a great dog Angel was. But boy, that, that dog was the happiest, most friendly dog ever. Sometimes drove me crazy because it was a little crazy. But nonetheless, you couldn't make the dog mad at you. You just couldn't. The dog was just always approachable. When you think of a breed that's not so approachable, what kind of breed would you say? Somebody said a chihuahua? <laughs> I love that. That's awesome. Okay. That's good. What else do you think of? Pitbull. 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 I've had this happen so many occasions where I'll, like, I'll be walking a neighborhood and uh, if somebody has a pit bull in their front yard and the dog will run and it, it stopped right at the edge of the grass, but it's coming at me and I'm looking at this dog. I'm like, this dog does not look like it comes in peace. You know what I mean? And, and then the, and the owner, this guy who always says this to you, he goes, oh, don't worry, he'll stop. <laughs> what if I don't trust you? You know what I mean? Like, I've never gone running from a lab. Oh, no, the lab's coming to get me. Because it, the lab carries itself with an attitude like, no, oh, I'm approaching. There's a smile on the face of the dog. A pit bull shows you its teeth. Last night, a guy came up to you because you're not going to believe this. This happened to me this week. What? He goes, there's a German shepherd in our neighborhood, and I just, like, this dog just goes crazy. I'm like, I'm going to win that German Shepherd's favor. So he goes, I brought treats. I started giving treats to the dog, and the dog starts being nice. And then I went over to try to pet the dog, and he put his arm out, and he showed me the bite wound from the... <laughs> Nothing against German Shepherds, by the way, and that breed. God bless all German Shepherds. But this dog bit his arm. He showed me the wound. He goes, that just happened. I go, yeah, I guess he wasn't coming in peace. Question for you. Which are you more like? A lab or a pit bull? You want to be more like a lab. You want to be, you want to carry yourself with that attitude of peace even when conflict comes. Dennis Johnson says this, God's peacemakers cannot simply ignore peace-destroying sin and error any more than a surgeon can simply close up an infection, infection's wound. An abscess in, is bound to develop. I want to reemphasize to you, I don't think being passive about sin is actually loving at all. But my point is this, you can deal with sin and still be ruled by the peace of Christ. You might be in a hard situation right now and you might be anxious about it, but can I just tell you something? The peace of Christ is sufficient to rule in that situation. Second thing we see in verse 16, I love this, is to let the word of Christ saturate your mind and relationships. I will tell you this, the peace of Christ won't rule if the word of Christ isn't in you. Look at verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. I love this phrase here, to dwell in you richly. Uh, it's, it's an imperative. Uh, it's a parallel, clearly, to the rule of Christ in your life. But the idea is a habit of life. To dwell richly means, literally, you could write this down, to feel at home at. That the word of Christ is just at home in you. In fact, turn over, uh, just make a little right-hand turn in your Bible. It's just a couple pages over to 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2. In verse 13, it says this, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. And we also thank God constantly for this. So he loves them, he's thankful for them, overflowing with thanksgiving, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God. I love that. Like, it doesn't matter what Chris says from this platform. The only thing that matters is what the word of God says. And my only job is to make that known. And then let God do what he's going to do in your hearts and lives. But I love this idea that they received it. Like, like does God's word have a, a warm welcome in your heart, in your life, in your spiritual home, if you will? So if, I, if you were to come to my house today and I said to you, make yourself at home. Meaning you come over, we're going to watch football. Okay, make yourself at home. That means when you want something to drink, just get up and get it. If you see strips on the table, go get them. Now, and I want you to imagine for a second, like you're just making yourself at home. And now all of a sudden you go in and you like open the freezer and you start pulling out, you know, my frozen dinners and you're heating one of those up. Like, okay, well, he's making himself at home. That's cool. 
Like he always talks about his oatmeal, so you make yourself a bowl of oatmeal. Okay, that's cool too. Have some blueberries, put some milk on it. That's how it's best. That's how it's going to be served in heaven. <laughs> and then you decide, you know what, I'm kind of tired. And you go back to my bedroom and you climb in my bed and take a nap. Okay, so really making yourself home. Then you see my wallet back there and you get into my wallet and you take my money out of my wallet and you put it in your pocket. You're certainly dwelling abundantly. I would say to you, get out. Exactly. I didn't mean that. You said make yourself at home. I didn't mean that. But that's exactly what this passage means. Let the word of Christ dwell in every little part of your heart, every part of your life. Don't have any place in your heart or in your life where God's word, the word of Christ, isn't dwelling in you richly. Because if Christ is going to rule, his word must certainly dwell. And then notice this, and and continue, it says, teaching, and I love this, it goes on, so so the word dwells, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. So the word isn't to stay there, the word is to be distributed through us. Teaching means to instruct. What this means is this, is that this is for the whole church family. Did you know that? You're actually, you're calling on your life. It's really clear that your call to this is actually to disciple others in some way or another. Find somebody who knows less than you do, teach them everything you know. You know a major motivation for learning the word so that you can pass it on to other people around you? A lot of you are parents in this room. You just need to think of that as your little church. Like, I've got to pass on. But notice what he says is to to do this, and and, and, and she says teaching and admonishing, that's literally the word for counseling. That's why as a church, when we counsel, we counsel from the word of God. What else do we have to offer? Eternal truth. Like, here, here's the answer. And then it says this, one another, so that's all of us, each other. It's not just the pastor up front, in all wisdom. Now, you could read that as in all biblical wisdom, which is true. You're teaching and admonishing. But here, I think the really the, the idea here is, is that you do it with wisdom. When you teach, when you counsel, you do it with wisdom. In other words, in the right way at the right time. In Proverbs chapter 15, it talks about apples of gold and settings of silver. It's actually Proverbs 25, verse 11. And the idea is, it's, it, so is a word aptly spoken. Like there's a right time to teach people things, and there's a wrong time to do that. Like it's just not appropriate. When somebody's grieving, it's not the time to necessarily, you know, preach them a sermon. We were at somebody's house this week, Pastor David and I. Somebody lost their, their husband. Uh, just a, what a wonderful, sweet marriage they had and she's really grieved it's not a time for us it's just a time to be like Job's friends and sit and listen and be careful what we say and gently point back to Jesus certainly not a time to confront over sin or bust into a hey by the way oh I'm so sorry about your husband can I just kind of go over my sermon with you this weekend I'd love to practice on you like what it's not the right time can I just say it to parents too there are right times and right ways to approach your adult kids, your teenage kids, it's different, different seasons. You can't always do it. They're not five anymore. They're not going to receive it like they did when they were five. And so, so you do it with this wisdom that God can provide. And so we do that for one another. And then notice this. It's so interesting. He then says something that is really enlightening about our worship. He says, so we admonish one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with thanksgiving in your hearts to God. Everybody in the world has tried to figure out what's the difference between singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. They're obviously all just songs of praise to God. But it's connected to this idea of teaching and admonishing one another. Have you ever thought of this before? That when we sing in church, we are first and foremost singing to God and about God. But as we sing things that are doctrinally true, we're actually singing to each other. Like... One of the reasons you should sing in church is because by doing that, what we're saying is, yes, we all believe this, but we're also singing it to one another. So when we sing of the glorious gospel, which we have through so many songs today, Christ is risen from the dead, you're not only saying it, Lord, we believe this, you're not just singing it to yourself, you're actually singing it to those around you. And Maybe you think, man, I wish that guy next to me would sing better, but maybe you should just hear what he's singing instead of how he's singing. I'm saying that mostly for people who have been sitting up front with me here most recently. And so inward worship does impact our outward relationships. John Kitchen says this, God's intent is that we live together in peace ruling, thanks expressing, 
word indwelling and praise singing assemblies. I love that. That's the kind of church that Jesus desires. And then the third thing we see is that we're to let the glory of Christ govern our relationships. So we're, we're to let the peace of Christ rule our hearts. We're, let the, we're, we're to be saturated in, in the word of Christ. And then finally, to let the glory of Christ govern our relationships. In other words, as I said at the beginning, he is worthy of us pursuing healthy relationships. And when we do that, we're being like him. He pursued that with us, and so now we pursue that with those around us to the best of our ability. And so when we do that, we bring him glory. Look at verse 17. And whatever you do, remember the context here, all about relationships, in word or deed. So in other words, with my lips and with my life, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So whatever is an all-inclusive word. And so in word or deed, the idea is like bring everything, all of my words, all of my deeds under a microscope and ask this one question. Is what I'm saying and how I'm acting, does it bring glory to God? Does it actually make Jesus look good? That's what he's saying there. Do it all to his glory. Wow, what if I really did live that way? What does it mean to do something in the name of the Lord Jesus? I think it means two things. Number one, it speaks of the authenticity that we should bear, remembering that we actually represent Jesus in everything we're doing. We bear his name. So it's kind of like your family name, right? Like, like, don't do anything that would ruin the family name. You know those kinds of things, right? Those, those phrases. I was in Germany once, and uh, we were visiting a cemetery, and it was amazing. Uh, I went to a graveyard that was pre-World War II, and there were a lot of people named Adolf. And I thought, wow, there's a German that came along and kind of ruined that name for a lot of people. You know, in the Bible... Actually, the word Judah means praise, right? One of the Old Testament tribes, praise. Honorable name. And the New Testament, New Testament equivalent to that name is Judas. Kind of ruined that, didn't he? Like, what do you assume? I mean, I was going to say, anybody name their kid Judas, but just in case? I might shorten it, come up with a nickname, whatever, but we represent Jesus. So doesn't that change everything? Like all of a sudden, you're in a, a dispute with a, your spouse, maybe your kids, maybe a coworker, maybe in the body of Christ. And you just go back and go, hey, you know what? First and foremost, I represent Jesus. I don't represent, not first and foremost, because we saw earlier that he said in this church there was uncircumcised, circumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, Greek, Jew, I, I, those are not how I find my identity in any of those labels that maybe I previously wore. Right now, all I am is a follower of Jesus. Is he pleased with how I'm acting? Again, I've told you, to pursue peace does not mean you can secure peace. Because that takes two sides. But what's great about the scriptures are, you're only responsible for one person. If God is pleased, then I'm pleased. I feel like I did all that I could. The second thing that it means is authority. So it means living authentically, you bear his name, but it also does mean authority. Then in the name of Jesus, it's like when uh, somebody signs a check. For those of you who know, there used to be these pieces of paper, you'd write it out, sign it, and that would actually, people would give you money if you signed it. I know, it's crazy, isn't it? But, but it's the idea of like, like his signature on it. Here's why this matters. When God commands us to do something, he always gives his enablements. So we go under the power and the authority of Christ. Like, I'm doing this with his authority. He tells me to go seek peace. I go in that authority believing that he can do anything. If he can reconcile us to him, then he can reconcile us to other people. What's the impossible situation that you could imagine right now? Like, there's no way. That's not going to happen. That person's too angry. They're too bitter. They never would. Pursue it to the best of your ability. See what God could do. Listen to John chapter 14, verses 13 to 14. Jesus says this, and I will do whatever you ask in my name. That means according to my plan and for my glory, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son, you ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. So many people have perverted this verse to mean, oh, that means I can have an airplane, or I can get a Tesla, or whatever you might put on your list. It's not what Jesus is saying. It's not a name it, claim it verse. What he's saying is this, is when you're walking according to my will, 
I'm going to do it. You ask me. And I do believe this. God would want you to ask him, Lord, would you bring healing in this relationship? Would you help me to be a person that is governed by the rule of peace, the rule of Christ's peace in my life? And so when we pray, we pray by his power. We pray for his purposes. And we pray that in it all, Christ would be preeminent, that he would get the glory. And I think when brothers and sisters in the church dwell together in unity, it brings him glory. Notice, we're not talking about today the differences that we hold. We're talking about what we have in common, the rule of peace. John Kitchen goes on to say this. We live with one another in this word-reigning, grace-receiving, edification-dealing way on a horizontal level because there is all the while a vertical relationship with God that is governing our earthly relationships. So does Christ's peace rule in your life? Does the word of Christ saturate your heart? So you even know, how, how would Jesus respond in this situation? So know his word. And, and then finally, is, is, am, I, am I a person who really is governed by the glory of Christ? It's not about me winning an argument. It's about Christ's reputation. And then notice, what does he say? And be thankful. I don't know if you picked this up, but all three verses had the word thankful, thankful, thankful. I do think it's kind of like this umbrella of thankfulness to God, but also here just thankfulness for other people. When's the last time that you prayed to God thanking him for even the person that maybe you're at odds with at the moment where you don't have peace? Maybe you're like, just find, start finding evidence of grace. Do you know that will soften your heart toward them? Lord, Lord, I know we're not getting along, but I do see how you've worked in their life this way. I do see these traits about them. I thank you for them. I even thank you for this conflict because I know from it, I'm going to grow. Like, this is revealing things about me. Like, thank you, Lord. Like, you walk in that gratitude. Some of you right now are going, you don't know the person I'm at odds with. There is nothing to be thankful for. Trust me. Trust me, there is. Look for evidence of grace and give thanks. It will help you to be a person of peace. In conclusion, I just want to conclude with a quote that I think summarizes this whole three-week series so well. It's from Ray Ortland. He said this, The gospel being what it is and always will be the message of reconciliation. Do you remember that? We actually preach a message of reconciliation. God reconciling himself to man. Our churches should be, I love this, the most reconciling, peaceable, relaxed, happy places in town. I agree. We are so open to enemies, so meek in the face of insults and injuries, so forgiving toward the undeserving. If we do make people angry, let it be for this reason. We refuse to join in their selfish battles. We're following a higher call. We are peacemakers, the true sons of God. Let me pray. Father, I do pray that you would Remind us as we pursue peaceful relationships and obedience to your call in our lives. Lord, that our unrighteous anger will not produce peaceful relationships. Lord, I pray that we would put on the garments of kindness and love and generosity. The garments that you've given us in the spirit, the fruit of the spirit. And Father, I pray today for everybody in this room that the peace of Christ would rule their hearts, my heart. Father, where there's anxiety over future situations, I just pray that Christ's peace would rule, be the umpire, the deciding factor. And where there's division, Father, I pray that we wouldn't bring revenge and anger to the table, but we would just bring peace. And may it be for your glory, Jesus. We represent you, and we're honored to do so. In Jesus' name, amen.